Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, um, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to our uh, to our uh, webinar by MB, uh, by MBRU. This is uh, Muhammad Jamal, assistant professor in anodontic. And today our topic is about enhancing patient care uh, judicious implementation of CBCT in your practice is by Dr. Johan Zab Chuchadri. Uh, next slide. So Dr. Johan Zib, he is uh, associate uh, professor in oral and maxillofacial uh, radiology and, and he has uh, a diplomate. Uh, and uh, and he is a board uh, is certified and he is a consultant in oral maxillofacial radiologist at the DDH and hold a consultant uh, OMR uh, in New York and Ohio in the in the uh, United States. Please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Gigi Johansen. Uh, Dr. Johansen, uh, can you share the screen, please? Uh, sure. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Jamal, thank you very much uh, for the introduction um, and greetings, everyone. Um, so today uh, I'll be talking about how uh, uh, you can implement cone beam CT imaging in your practice. Uh, basically, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, the background uh, and uh, then the technology itself. Um, and then I will move on to some selected cases uh, from our archive uh, where, um, you know, uh, considering all the current guidelines uh, and uh, in light of those guidelines, it'll show you uh, cases where uh, CBCT has significantly increased uh, patient care. So moving on, uh, no conflict of interest to the clear here. Uh, so this is a typical cone beam CT scanner. Um, and uh, as you can see that this one is where a patient sits uh, in uh, the machine uh, and it has uh, a gantry, uh, a sensor on the right side and the X-ray tube on the left side. Um, so let me turn this on. It's a short video. Uh, so it's about 29 or 30 seconds long, and the scan is now complete. So it took about 12 seconds to uh, complete the full scan of the full head. Uh, it's you know it, it's really amazing if you come to think about it. Uh, you are scanning uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, anatomy of a patient in about 12 seconds uh, with uh, a significantly uh, less radiation dose uh, compared to other imaging modalities uh, which can give us similar kind of information. So the art and science of dentistry, you know, uh, it involves the appreciation for the aesthetics as well as for the science uh, and to deliver the best results. Uh, a high level of precision is needed. You know, as dentists, we know that, you know, we, we work in uh, millimeter and submillimeter level uh, accuracy and precision. Um, the foundation of high level uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment is, uh, is, is accurate diagnosis. You have to have uh, a good diagnosis before you proceed on with, uh, with, uh, with the treatment. Uh, and especially as uh, treatments are becoming more, uh, more advanced, more technologically dependent and uh, more involved. Um, uh, this precision is needed more than ever. And uh, as clinicians, we have access to a lot of diagnostic tools. And uh, radiology is, 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 of course, one of those tools. Uh, it all started back in 1895 when uh, Dr. William Conrad Rankin, uh, he was a German uh, physicist. Uh, he was working in his lab and he accidentally discovered the um, and the, uh, uh, the the x-rays and uh, the x in the x in the word x-ray is uh, comes from the fact that at that time they did not or he did not know no one knew at that time that what it is uh, but it was it was realized that it was a, it was a wonderful thing and it can do wonders uh, and um, I mean considering the importance of that he received the first Nobel Prize in 1901 for 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 discovering the the x-radiation so Jump about uh, 
about 77 years uh, to 1971 when uh, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield and Sir Alan Carmack, uh, they discovered or they, uh, they not discovered, but they, they, uh, uh, they invented a CT. Uh, and this is the, uh, the first CT scanner um, that Dr. Hounsfeld created, and it could only scan the head. Uh, and it will take um, about 25 minutes to scan uh, the, uh, the, the, the head. So the patient has to be in, their, in the scanner for 25 minutes to scan the whole head. And then the, the data that was produced, it would take days to reconstruct the data. Um, but uh, it was realized that this technology was really uh, can do wonders for patient care, for enhancing patient care. Um, we have uh, now the seventh generation. Uh, this is the, uh, the current generation of the CT scanners. Uh, they are called 64 slice or multi slice CT scanners, and they can scan the you know the same head anatomy in maybe a minute uh, or, or two minutes depending on the resolution, um, and with radiation dose which is of course also less than uh, than before. So um, uh, there has been significant advancement in this technology. Now, um, 23 years later, in 1994, uh, four researchers in Italy. Uh, they uh, they uh, developed or invented cone beam CT scan scanners. So this is the first uh, ever cone beam CT scanner, and it kind of looks like uh, the 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 scanners that that are that you see in the hospitals. And um, uh, so uh, you know the 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 original or the first cone beam CT scanner was in fact like this, and they are still available in the market, uh, and they are made by Newton still. Uh, and it's called Newton uh, 9000. Um, the patient would lie down and uh, the, uh, the patient's head uh, would go into the gantry and it can be scanned uh, fairly quickly as compared to uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the conventional CT scanners. Uh, interestingly, the CBCT technology, uh, before uh, these four researchers, uh, they uh, optimized it for dental and maxillofacial imaging. Uh, the work has been has been going on for at least a decade before that, and the the uh, uh, the uh, the intent was to use it in cardiac imaging and not in dental and maxillofacial imaging, but it wasn't very successful at the time uh, in, in in imaging the beating heart, um, and it was uh, it was uh, you know and then in 1991 it was uh, adapted for for dental and maxillofacial applications. Uh, just uh, just an example, an interesting uh, shot uh, that I found um, from a colleague. Uh, and as you can see that, this is a coronal cone beam CT view. And uh, there is a dislodged implant which has uh, dislodged from the maxilla and is now uh, into the nose. So these things happen. Um, and, uh, and, and, and CBCT is the best imaging modality to, among many other things, to, uh, to evaluate and to assess these kind of uh, mishaps as well. So what is uh, cone beam CT imaging? Uh, is, it, is it different than conventional CT? Um, holistically, no, but technically, yes. Um, the main difference between cone beam CT and conventional CT or the CT scanners which are found in hospitals um, or independent imaging centers, uh, is that cone beam CT is optimized for heart tissue imaging, for bone and for teeth, uh, whereas conventional CT has broader, uh, uh, it, can, it can image a broader range of tissues. So that's where the main difference comes from. And then of course there are technical uh, differences and differences in radiation dose uh, as well. Um, uh, see what the next uh, slide has here. Uh, so briefly, uh, as I explained uh, in one of the previous slides, that uh, around the patient head, uh, the structure of the machine is called the gantry. On one side, in this picture, uh, the section of the gantry on the left side uh, is the where the x-ray tube is. And on the other side of the patient's head, on the right side, is uh, the sensor. Uh, so this gantry makes a 360 degree rotation around the patient's head uh, and, uh, and generate a CBCT scan uh, this way. 
So the name cone beam CT comes from the shape of the X-ray beam. So the shape of the X-ray beam, as you can see in this picture, is cone shaped. And then uh, uh, there's another term uh, that you see here is called field of view. So field of view, uh, and I will talk about this uh, later as well, uh, but uh, a very important term to remember and keep in mind when we talk about cone beam CT imaging. Uh, so field of view refers to the, uh, the, the area of interest or the region of interest or the, the part of the patient's anatomy that you want to image. Um, so uh, in a single rotation, uh, depending upon mainly that on the selected resolution of the scan. If it's a high resolution scan or, or a low resolution scan, anywhere from 150 to up to 600 individual images are required during this 360 degree rotation. Um, and so this is a bit of an explanation of what a, an FOV or field of view is. So in this slide, you see um, uh, nine different field of views, which are represented by these uh, by these green circles. Um, so uh, let's look at the first one, uh, the top left. Uh, it says the FOV is eight centimeters by five centimeters. So always, when the uh, the FOV is written in a correct manner, uh, the first number represents the diameter of that green circle. Of that's that's the that's the uh, the diameter of the green circle which is eight centimeter in that first image. And then the height. The height is represented by the second number, which in this case is five centimeters. So if you go to the last image here, uh, the green circle is significantly large. It's pretty much covering the whole head. And uh, the diameter is 23 centimeters and the height is 17 centimeters. So um, the eight centimeter by five centimeter would be considered small field of view. And then there are multiple uh, field of views in between and 23 uh, centimeter by 17 centimeter FOV is considered to be a large field of view. And selection of the field of view uh, depends on the indication or what is your primary purpose of taking the scan. And we'll talk about that as we uh, uh, move uh, during the presentation. So uh, for example, this is a 3D reconstruction uh, from a cone beam CT scan um, and uh, uh, so what do you think the FOV would be? So let me go back here. So I think it kind of matches, uh, if we look at here, the top is about uh, the base of the skull, um, just above you know, the, the lower part of the forehead, all the way up to the inferior border of the mandible. Uh, so if we uh, look here, uh, it, it probably corresponds to 16 centimeter by 10 centimeters. So that's the, about the medium uh, or the maxillofacial uh, field of view. Okay, so uh, earlier uh, I mentioned one difference between conventional CT and cone beam CT. Now, uh, before I uh, move on and explain these things, um, sometimes I feel that you know using uh, using uh, a conventional CT as a comparison with cone beam CT is uh, it, it is not really relevant in dentistry, and and the reason is that before cone beam CT. Uh, was introduced for dental and maxillofacial imaging. Dentists would not be using, you know, maybe oral surgeons or maybe some periodontists who were involved in in, in implant uh, uh, treatments, um, uh, dental implants. They may have an exposure to conventional CT uh, scanners, but uh, mainstream dentistry did not have much of a use of conventional CT. That said, when cone beam CT came. Um, we did not have any reference for this in the in the in the different imaging modalities that we used to use in dentistry. We still use them, for example, intraoral imaging and panoramic imaging and you know cephalometric imaging. Um, so, cone beam CT cannot really sort of correlate with any of the 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 uh, the imaging modalities that we are used to as dentists. So, uh, the the closest uh, uh, the closest you know comparison can that can be done is with conventional CT. That's why we sort of have to bring that in. So, if you look here, the image in the top left uh, shows how a cone beam CT scan is acquired, and the one in the uh, in the upper right uh, shows how a a, a a conventional CT scan is acquired. 
So in cone beam CT, uh, the, uh, the image, uh, the detector is large and the, the shape of the beam is cone shaped. So it can cover a large uh, area of the anatomy in just one go. So it, it's gonna rotate around the patient's head one time and capture all that data. Um, on the other side, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, conventional uh, CT scanners, uh, they, have, uh, they have a much smaller uh, detector. Uh, the newer ones, uh, they have up to 64 of these individual uh, uh, slices, so uh, stacked on top of each other. Uh, so they are able to uh, now produce images as fast, pretty much as fast as cone beam CT. But here, um, uh, traditionally speaking, uh, the, uh, the, the gantry has to rotate around the patient's head multiple times to acquire uh, a, 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 an area uh, or region of interest or part of the patient's anatomy. And then the second uh, main difference is that the basis images and, or the raw images, uh, for simplicity's sake, you can say that, or the basis projections, uh, in cone beam CT, they are, they are lateral head kind of projections that you can see in the lower left corner. With uh, with conventional CT, the, the basis projections, they are axial uh, views, as you can see in the, uh, in the uh, lower right corner. But uh, the end result uh, is exactly the same. So um, uh, if you take two scans of the same patient with cone beam CT and, and, uh, and conventional CT, uh, as a clinician, what you're seeing on the screen is exactly the same from cone beam CT as well as the fan beam CT, because all that data is then uh, you know, processed by algorithms which uh, present the final image or the final product, the same as you can see in the middle uh, lower part of the screen. Okay, so um, just uh, some familiarity with the, um, uh, with the, uh, 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 how we view uh, the, uh, the, 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 the data volume that is generated by a cone beam CT scan or a CT scan. Um, so we have uh, this three-dimensional anatomy of the patient, um, and we can look at it in three dimensions, as the name 3D suggests, which is the axial view, as if you're looking from the top or the bottom, and the sagittal view, as if you're looking from the right side or the left side, or the coronal view, you're looking from the front or the back. Um, so, and that can be explained uh, here as well. Uh, okay, so uh, same, um, uh, same short video uh, that I showed you earlier. So let's see, our patient is sitting here and uh, we have positioned the patient properly and uh, the gantry is rotating around the patient's head. In about 12 seconds, the scanning is complete. So it means that the basis projections or the raw data has been acquired. And this other rotation where the gantry is coming back is essentially where the extra tube is turned off and the patient is not being exposed. The machine is just coming back to its original position. So the scan is done. Now, this is how uh, the, when those anywhere from 150 to 600 images are, are put together as a volume, this is how it looks like. Uh, and this is not something that is very useful to us as clinicians. So this needs to be further processed. Uh, so to, uh, to, uh, to present the images in a more meaningful way that can be used clinically. So this is how uh, uh, the, uh, when uh, the raw data or the basis images or the basis projections, they are processed. Uh, and this is how the post-processed image looks like uh, that we scan. So it's starting from uh, right about the, uh, the, the forehead area of the patient and going down all the way um, to the uh, level of the inferior border of the mandible. So in 12 seconds, all this data was, 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 was acquired and is, is presented to us in a very, uh, you know, understandable, clinically understandable and clinically relevant way. So this is really amazing. And uh, this is, it, it is done uh, very quickly with, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, very as much or as little radiation exposure as possible. I think I jumped a few slides. All right, so um, the, um, 
interpretation protocol. So now we have, uh, in the previous slide, you saw that we have our reconstructed or post-processed uh, post -processed image. Now it has to be interpreted. Interpretation can, can broadly be classified into task-specific interpretation and interpretation of the whole volume. So this is an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, discussion here. Um, it's, a, it's a very long discussion in its own, but I'll keep it brief. Uh, Task-specific interpretation is, for example, let's say uh, you are a general dentist and uh, you have a patient who is needing implants, so you're evaluating a patient for, uh, for implant treatment planning. Um, and you took the scan for that. So let's say you wanted to place an implant in, uh, in, 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 in posterior mandible, you know, two, three, four, whatever number of implants. So that's the task that, that was your main indication for taking the scan. Uh, and you will interpret that scan uh, from your perspective of implant treatment planning. That's a task specific interpretation. And any clinician, and, uh, and these days, you know, uh, if you're not really uh, well versed uh, in Convium CT, um, you need to, uh, uh, you need to, you know, get yourself acquainted uh, and up to speed with how to, how to view and how to interpret CVCT scans. So uh, the task specific is, for example, in this case, that the clinician, the prescribing clinician should be able to view the scan and do everything uh, that is required in the process of implant treatment plan. So that's task specific. Now, we not only have imaged that, uh, that posterior mandible with implants will go, but we have imaged you know, from here all the way to here. So from base of skull all the way to the inferior border of mandible. So the whole data set, the whole volume needs to be interpreted as well. Um, and that's an important thing to, to, to keep in mind. So let's see what the literature says about that. So this is uh, from uh, the Journal of American Dental Association uh, in 2012. So they came out essentially, uh, you can read this paper, the references here. Uh, I'm just gonna give you the, uh, the very pertinent information. So the complete image data set must be interpreted by an appropriately qualified healthcare provider. Now, as a dentist, uh, you are qualified to uh, prescribe and, and read a CVCT scan. Uh, so the prescribing clinician should receive a thorough radiological report. If the prescriber also interprets the CVCT images, he or she should enter the findings into the patient record and communicate them appropriately to the patient. So this, this whole thing needs to be followed as it is. So, you prescribe a CT scan, you acquired the scan, now you are reviewing it, and then you have to write down the findings, and then you have to convey those findings to the patient um, uh, or the guardian of the patient if the patient is a minor. Now, um, the same analogy can be applied here as well, that, um, that uh, for example, uh, for third molar extraction, uh, if you generally refer your patients for third molar extraction to an oral surgeon, and if you generally refer your patients uh, for to an endodontist for posterior teeth, for example, for end endodontic treatment of posterior teeth, uh, if you refer your patients to an, an orthodontist for, uh, for 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 orthodontic treatment, uh, so same analogy is applied here. That uh, that if you think that you are qualified, you're confident enough, you are trained enough that you can interpret the whole volume, you know, then that's fine. But if you're not confident, if you're not comfortable reading the whole volume other than the, the region of interest, then of course, it is better to send out the scan to a radiologist. It could be an oral maxillofacial radiologist or it could be a, a medical radiologist. And both are qualified uh, to give you a, or to provide uh, you a report, uh, a comprehensive report of the uh, CVCT scan. So at, at the Bay Dental Hospital, this uh, we uh, all the scans that we take, we uh, they are read by me. Uh, I'm the consultant radiologist there, and this is how our reports look like. Uh, so they have uh, the patient demographic information, medical dental history, clinical information, diagnostic objectives, why the scan was acquired, uh, and then the findings. The findings are listed, you know, one by one. And at the end, there is impression, um, and then the recommendations are also part of the report, and then selected images uh, of uh, the areas of interest, or if there are pathoses, if there are any abnormalities, uh, you know, the, the images are part of the report. So it's a very comprehensive report. And it's uh, these kind of reports are not just done by me, they're done by all uh, radiologists. So this is a pretty much standard for, for oral maxillofacial uh, radiology. Now, 
Another uh, reference I have here is the, it, this is a, a very comprehensive report. It's, it's about uh, you know 150 pages. And it's called Sedentext or Radiation Protection Report Number 172, Cone Beam CT for Dental and Maxillofacial Radiology Evidence-Based Guidelines. So this is by European Commission. So uh, all the countries in Europe uh, plus the UK, they had they, they came together and they they produced this this very extensive document that covers all the aspects of Cone Beam CT. It's a it, it, it's freely available uh, from uh, from Sedentex uh, website. You can just Google it and you should be able to find the report. So I'm just going to give you some very pertinent points. Um, and there are these 20 uh, basic principles that they list. Uh, so uh, about uh, interpreting, what they say is that uh, that for dental alveolar CBCT images of the teeth, their supporting structures, which is number 19 here, the mandible and the maxilla up to the floor of the nose. Um, clinical evaluation should be made by a specially trained dental maxillofacial radiologist. Um, and for non-dental alveolar small field of view, um, the uh, which includes the teeth, their supporting structures, the mandibles, including the TMJ and maxilla up to the floor of the nose, uh, clinical evaluation should be made by uh, by uh, by a trained DMFO. So essentially, what they are recommending is that. Uh, that anything beyond uh, uh, the uh, the uh, a small field of view or a small group of teeth should be read by a dental and maxillofacial radiologist uh, as the availability permits. And not all the places have dental and maxillofacial radiologists available. In that case, uh, you know, have a uh, have a medical radiologist perhaps uh, create the report for you. OK, uh, this is how a typical radiologist they look like and uh, and, uh, you know, it represents that in a very uh, lighthearted manner. So when we talk about cone beam CT, one of the most uh, uh, one of the most commonly asked question is, you know, how much the radiation is a patient being exposed to uh, compared to, let's say, a periapical image or a wiping image or a full mouth series or a panoramic image? Um, this uh, depends a lot on the imaging protocol, which in turn depend on the indication. Now, I've introduced a new term here called imaging protocol, and I'll, and I'll show you in the next slide uh, that what an imaging protocol is. But essentially, uh, the amount of radiation exposure depends on the indication, uh, and then you have to tailor or custom uh, design your imaging protocol according to that indication. So. What is an imaging protocol? And an imaging protocol is essentially a set of technical exposure parameters specific to an indication. Uh, and what are those technical parameters, which is the FOV? Now I showed you, explained to you what an FOV is. The slice thickness or voxel size. Uh, so this um, determines the resolution, if, an, if a scan will be high resolution scan or a low resolution scan, and then the scan time, uh, how, how long you, you want to scan them. Generally speaking, the things that you can adjust in a cone beam CT is the FOV and slice thickness of voxel size, which essentially are pretty much the same thing. Scan time is then automatically determined by the software or the machine. So now what is slice thickness of voxel size? So that uh, determines the, the, uh, the uh, resolution, if an image will be high resolution or low resolution. So let me give you an example. So for example, if the indication is that you want to uh, view the root canal anatomy of maxillary first molar. Uh, you want a really high resolution scan, uh, but also you don't want to scan the whole head. You just want to scan because the indication is to uh, essentially you know, look at the root canal anatomy of just one single tooth. So reduce the FOV as much as possible and increase the or decrease the slice thickness or uh, uh, the voxel size. So the lower the voxel size or the, 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 the thinner the slice is, the higher resolution will it be. Um, so uh, on the other hand, let's say if the patient is being scanned for orthodontic treatment planning, so you want to scan the whole head for that. Uh, and in that case, because you're not really looking for fine structures, so you can increase you know, uh, the voxel size, make it larger, and you can, uh, it means that you, the, you're increasing the slice thickness. So the, the the resolution of the scan will not be that high, but on the other side, you know, because you're not really looking for a very fine structure like root canal anatomy, it will still give you a, a, a decent and, and diagnostic quality 
uh, scan. A classification of the machines based on the field of view or FOV. So there are, you know, uh, probably close to 100 manufacturers which are manufacturing cone beam CT scanners these days. Uh, so broadly speaking, we can classify them as scanners which are able to scan small uh, areas of anatomy or up to medium uh, anat size areas of anatomy or large uh, areas of anatomy. So uh, generally it is understood that if a, a machine is capable of imaging up to 10 centimeter height uh, of a patient anatomy or FOV, uh, then it will be classified as a small FOV. Up to 15 is medium and large is greater than 15 centimeter. Generally, they are up to about 23 uh, centimeter height. Okay, so coming back to the radiation exposure. Uh, so then I will introduce some more terms um, uh, about radiation dose and we'll, we'll, we'll define those. Um, but before I do that, uh, so this study is from 2010. Um, and uh, it essentially is testing the, the effective dose, uh, which in dental and maxillofacial imaging or with cone beam CT is measured in microsieverts. As you can see that uh, in the left side on the, on the, uh, uh, along the, uh, the, uh, the graph. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, large FOV, medium FOV and small FOV, you can see that you know, the gray areas represent the average effective dose uh, measured in microsievert. Uh, and then there is standard deviation. As you can see there, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a large standard deviation for all of these three, and th there's a wide range of standard deviation. So on basis of these findings, so this study uh, suggested that a single average effective dose is not a concept that should be used for the modality of CVCT as a whole. So when comparing to alternative radiographic methods such as panoramic, intraoral radiography, and even, you know, conventional CT, uh, because, you know, the range of doses between different devices is too large to consider them as a single modality. So, um, how do we, you know, how do we simplify things? And I'll, and I'll, and I'll show you. Um, we cannot really uh, tighten it as much uh, for 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 radiation dose as much as we we have, you know, tightened results for conventional CT. But still, you know, we can have we can we, we have ranges to work with. So, um, as a comparison. Uh, the uh, the effective radiation dose in microsievert from a full mouth series with using phosphor plate image receptor or F speed film and round collimation round cone is 170.7 microsieverts. Uh, one panoramic, as you can, the, the two examples, one is orthofos and one is promax. So orthofos exposes the patient to 14.2, and promax, they both are panoramic, they both have CCD receptors. So the other one is exposing the patient to 24.3 microsievert for a single panoramic. And for lateral cephalometric, as you can see that the radiation dose is, uh, is, is 5.6. So uh, some, some of the, the, the same kind of data about effective dose about the cone beam CT scanners. So the, like I said, there are so many of them available these days, but these ones are more commonly used. And this study is from 2008, so it's about 12 years old. So these are the early uh, 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 scanners. As you can see that, uh, uh, you know, the for Galileos, uh, it could be anywhere from 29 to 54 microsieverts. In ICAT, it could be 135 to 69. Um, and in Newton, 45 to 37. And uh, Plan Mecca Pro Max, 157 to 210. And then there's a comparison with equivalent, you know, panoramic. So uh, a scan taken with uh, maximum uh, uh, maximum FOV, maximum dose, which is 54 microsievert for Galileos, it is equal to nine panoramic radiographs. Uh, and it, it is equal to about five and a half days of equivalent background radiation. So um, I, uh, let me just, uh, so just define these terms. So what is a radiation dose anyways? Um, radiation doses are three types. Uh, absorbed dose, equivalent dose, and effective dose. Absorbed dose is used to assess the potential for biochemical change in specific tissues, and it is measured in milligrams. Equivalent dose is used to assess how much biological damage is expected from the absorbed dose. It is measured in a different unit, millisievert. Uh, so different types of radiation have different damaging properties. So you know, X-rays will have a different kind of equivalent dose. Alpha 
particles or beta particles or, or gamma rays will have different kind of dose uh, for the same amount. And then the effective dose. Uh, the effective dose assesses the potential for long-term effects that might occur in the future, and this is also measured in millisievert. So all this information and a lot more is available at uh, radiologyinfo.org. It's a very useful website, uh, even for your patients who have concerns about radiation dose. This website explains everything in very simple terms, and this is uh, a very reliable website. It is uh, managed by Radiological Society of North America, which is the largest uh, radiology society uh, in the world. Um, so, for all practical purposes, as clinicians and as concerned patients, absorbed dose and equivalent dose are, are not that important. You know, they're important in, in calculating uh, the dose itself, but it's the effective dose that we are looking for. So, the effective dose is to be measured and accounted for and is calculated in millisievert. Uh, the dental doses, uh, even with cone beam CT, they are much smaller, so they are measured with micro. Uh, so that is something to keep uh, to keep in mind. So I've thrown a lot of number and thrown a lot of information on you. So I've, I've, I've sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, summarized that in this one slide. So what is the effective uh, average effective dose from these different imaging modalities or the, these different images, uh, kind of uh, uh, diagnostic imaging exams in micro -sievers? Um, so large FOV CBCD anywhere from 68 to 1073 microsievert from one scan, medium 45 to 860, small 19 to 652. So these doses are very large uh, or, or they have a very large uh, wide range. Panoramic is 9 to 24, a full mouth series with round collimation is 171. So in some cases, uh, as you can see that, uh, that uh, in some cases, not all, uh, that uh, a radiation dose from a full mouth series can be more than what is what you're getting from a CBCT scan. But that again depends on what FOV that you have selected, what is your essentially your imaging protocol, which depends on the FOV and the slice thickness or the voxel size. Uh, and similarly, you know, bite wings and full mouth series with a rectangular collimation. So this is, uh, I've summed it up all, all here. Now, as they say, there is an app for everything. If you are really interested in seeing how much radiation dose you are being exposed to, you can download this app uh, and it's available for, for iPhone and Android uh, operating systems both. It's called Track Your Dose. And it covers three main areas. It covers your travel. Uh, it covers uh, the dose that you may receive from, let's say, you know, going to a dentist or you know, going to your doctor, having a CT scan done, or uh, and uh, by your location, uh, where you're located. Uh, so because um, uh, radiation dose from the environment is different in different parts of the world. Some, some areas have uh, a lot of radiation coming from the soil and the other uh, parts of the world, they don't have any uh, in the soil. So this is my uh, data uh, and this is for about six months. And uh, this includes, you know, uh, some uh, some flights and you know some uh, medical exposure and some location information. And I was exposed to about 1,720 microsievert radiation uh, uh, during that uh, that about six months time in 2018. Okay, so a lot of the foods that we eat uh, have have uh, have radioactive uh, isotopes in them. So, for example, bananas. So bananas. Uh, have uh, have a radioactive uh, potassium uh, in them, um, and but the good news is that uh, that uh, the dose uh, from the potassium that you ingest when you eat a banana is not cumulative because it is rapidly excreted by the body, and uh, for every 150 grams of banana that you eat, uh, you're exposed to 0.1 microsievert of radiation, um, and similarly. Uh, you know, uh, if in your kitchen or in your bathroom you have granite countertops or, or maybe marble countertops um, uh, or, or marble floors or granite floors, uh, they also have radioactive, uh, you know, isotopes which are continuously emitting uh, radiation. Um, but, you know, uh, don't go in and gut your kitchen or your floor because, you know, this dose is, is not that great uh, and, uh, and it's just part of the normal uh, daily uh, life. All right.
So I've thrown a lot of information on you, a lot of numbers, and hope you're not feeling like this bear. Uh, Okay, all right, so uh, let's talk about uh, the current uses uh, of cone beam CT, so more of a uh, more of a clinical part. So I look at the time, okay, you're doing okay with the time. Okay, so let's start with, uh, uh, let's look at uh, the region or the anatomy uh, uh, and, and then uh, see what, what, uh, uh, what results we can get by applying uh, cone beam CT versus other kind of uh, imaging modalities. So let's start with the roots, the root canal system, and the periapical pathology. So fairly common, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, indications uh, for uh, patients to come to your practice uh, and for you to image them as part of your, you know, your uh, your, your, your diagnosis and treatment planning process. So. Uh, I'm going to start with a joint position statement by the American Association of Endodontists and the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology. It was published in 2015, so about um, about five years ago. So they have 12 recommendations uh, uh, about and not just cone beam CT, you know, just uh, they cover all the imaging modalities uh, and give specific, you know, uh, recommendations regarding use of cone beam CT for, for endodontics. So they say intraoral radiographs should be considered the imaging modality of choice for initial evaluation of the endodontic patient. Um, so, you know, that that's, that's that's pretty standard and that should be, you know, uh, should be kept in mind. <clears throat> so patients who present with contradictory or non-specific clinical signs and symptoms associated with untreated or previously endodontically treated. So essentially, you know, retreat patients. So this is where uh, you know there will be uh, indication for cone beam CT in case of uh, retreat patients or non-specific clinical signs and symptoms. So teeth with potential for extra canal. So for example, mesiobuccal two canal and maxillary first uh, molars. Uh, identification and localization of the calcified canal. So if you're suspecting, if you took a periapical and it seems like you know there may be the canal may be calcified, you cannot see the canal. That may be an indication. Uh, for, for cone beam CT. Intraoral radiographs should be considered the imaging modality of choice for immediate post-operative imaging. Um, so there is a reason for that. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, that once, uh, now it's post-operative, uh, you, have, you have completed the endodontic treatment, the root canal uh, material is in there, the root canal filling is in there, and when we, uh, unfortunately, when we scan teeth with root canal uh, 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 root treated teeth with root fillings in there, they cause uh, for, cause artifacts and that reduce the diagnostic efficacy. So uh, the uh, here uh, the imaging modality of choice uh, generally is 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 intraoral radiograph. There are certain situations where you can still go for cone beam CT, but generally it is intraoral radiograph. So recommendation six: if clinical examination in two D intraoral radiography are inconclusive in the detection of vertical root fracture. So, you know, root fractures now uh, are, are, are uh, kicked uh, kick in here. Uh, Non-healing of previous anodontic treatment to help determine the need for further treatment, such as non-surgical, surgical, or extraction. So if you have to decide, you know, what to do uh, because the, treat the previous treatment is not effective, you know, then uh, conium CT can be of great help. Non-surgical retreatment to assess endodontic treatment complications, you know, overextended root canal, separated endodontic instruments, and localization of perforation. So uh, this is also a very good indication for cone beam CT. To localize root apices uh, and to evaluate the proximity to the adjacent anatomical structures such as inferior canal. Uh, surgical placement of implants. So that's that's the most common indication for cone beam CT. And then uh, dentoalveolar trauma, root fractures, luxation or displacement of teeth. So essentially anything related to trauma, that is a really good indication for cone beam CT. And the last one is localization and differentiation of external and internal resorptive teeth. So root resorption, uh, if it is affecting uh, the how you're going to treat um, uh, the patient and how you're going to proceed with the treatment. So the first example here is a 46 year old female. So the patient has persistent pain in right posterior maxilla, uh, after the root canal treatment. So in this periapical image, what we are seeing is that, uh, you know, the root canal is, is, is fairly okay. Uh, maybe uh, the apex of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the palatal root, uh, the, uh, the root filling does not go all the way there. 
Um, but there is no periapical lesion. Uh, the PDL space really looks normal. There is no, you know, periapical radiolucency or radio opacity. Everything looks okay. The only thing here is that there is some extrusion of root filling uh, material. Now, where is where could this be? Is it is it could could it be in the buccal soft tissue, the lingual soft tissue, or in the in the sinus? So where is this extruded um, material going? And you know. Is this the one that is causing pain? Is there a root fracture here or is there something else going on? Um, because the patient's pain is not going away. So we took a CBCT and um, we can see that, you know, there is uh, there is uh, apical, uh, you know, transportation. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the there's there's root perforation and as a consequence, you know, the uh, the uh, uh, root filling material has extruded into the lingual soft tissues, and it was the 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 uh, uh, this extruded material which was causing pressure and pain, and the patient was constantly complaining uh, of pain. So uh, that's why uh, you know we uh, we took this and we found out that there was no fracture and there's an issue uh, with extrusion of root filling material into the adjacent soft tissues, and of course there's an issue with the uh, root filling and root preparation or, or the canal preparation of the parallel root of the tube. Uh, this is a 14-year-old female uh, evaluation for number uh, 22 two and 23. Um, so uh, the uh, the as you can see that uh, the canine here is uh, is positioned fairly buckly compared to the adjacent, uh, you know, the, the lateral uh, and the and the first femur. So it was uh, it, it had to be determined, you know, what to do uh, with this tool um, uh, because if it has to be pulled back into the arch. Uh, space need to be made, uh, and then um, to determine what to do, the scan was taken. And in, in, in addition to uh, the the position of the canine uh, in relation to the adjacent teeth, what we are seeing here is that there is root resorption uh, in the lateral incisor, uh, number 2-2, uh, and there is sort of growth of you know, calcified tissue into the resolved part of the tooth, which you can clearly see in the uh, axial view, which is on the left side. So same patient, uh, another finding uh, with cone beam CT is that we found that there is a, den, uh, uh, there is a dense invagination uh, in this too, as you can see that. Uh, so these teeth, as we know, they have a poor prognosis uh, and, and, and generally develop periapical pathosis. So based on these findings, so it was determined that it is probably better because this tooth has root absorption, significant periodontal bone loss, which you can see in the, um, in the image on the right side, as well as dense, uh, you know, uh, invagination, uh, and all these uh, three uh, issues with these with this tooth um, uh, led us to extraction of this tooth and bringing the canine back into the arch. All right. So uh, another example of a 35-year-old female persistent pain post RCT in number one five. Um, uh, so uh, if you look at uh, these three images. Um, so number one five, um, uh, there is some extrusion of root filling, uh, and uh, but that's not you know uh, that significant, uh, so as to cause pain. Well, it can, but it doesn't look like it doesn't make sense that it, it may be causing pain. So um, this is the next slide is again of the same patient at a different level. Uh, so uh, that showed that this patient had a, a buccal bone graft placed uh, for implant uh, uh, placement in. Um, in number uh, in number one four area, uh, and it was that implant which got in, uh, that that buccal bone graft which got infected, and that was causing. When it was not the root canal treatment that was done, it was actually uh, the uh, the bone graft which got infected and was causing pain. Another example of a sixty four year old female persistent pain in number three one and four one post RCT done two years ago. So now this is uh, this is this is strange. So this is you know uh, sort of uh, uh, a, uh, a periapical was taken, and as you can see that uh, you know both the central incisors they have uh, nicely done root fillings, but they have a periapical radiolucency, um, and uh, there is uh, a uh, there is a, a sort of a, a radio opacity um, uh, also uh, in the periapical area of one of the teeth. Now uh, there. There's also periodontal bone loss, uh, about mild periodontal bone loss. 
Um, so now what to make of it? Most of the endodontically treated teeth have periapical radiodurcencies, which generally result from bone scars. So essentially, when the root canal treatment is done, um, the infection, uh, the periapical infection heals. So instead of normal bone reforming in that area, the area gets filled by scar tissue. It's similar to the scar that we get on our skin if you get a cut, uh, and that is called a bone scar. And that is, you know, harmful, and that should not cause any pain. But here, it is causing pain. Uh, whatever that is, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, so let's see uh, what uh, what we uh, see in the cone beam CT. So the scan was taken. As you can see that, you know, there is significant uh, periapical radiolucency. And not just that, there is resorption of the labial cortical plate. And um, uh, the green, uh, the uh, the arrow uh, 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 or the cross here is focused on uh, the fractured uh, apex of that that uh, that uh, number three one, uh, as you can see that. So it was not very clear in the periapical image, but uh, if you look in the image on the right side, uh, you will clearly see that you know there's a radio sort of ovoid radio opacity in the periapical area of the tooth, and this is the broken off apex of the tooth. So let's uh, look at here, and then not just uh, the uh, the uh, 3-1, but also 4-1 has a similar, you know, a broken off apex, which is sort of floating around in the area. So that uh, that um, uh, that uh, loss of the uh, patient's history of pain, patient is uh, complaining of pain, uh, there's a periapical radiolucency, there are these most likely infected you know, broken down APCs of both of these teeth floating around in the periapical area. There is a resorption of the labial cortical plate. Um, and let me show you this uh, quick video here, same patient. So we are going from one side to the other. Um, there's premolar, that's the canine, uh, lateral, uh, and then the central, as you can see that, you know, these are broken down, you know, root fragments, uh, which are present in the periapical area of that tooth. And uh, they're most likely infected. Root fractures, uh, in this example here, um, uh, the, there's a vertical root fracture of the mesiobuccal root of number 2-6, uh, uh, left maxillary first molar. Uh, and this is clearly seen, uh, not only vertical, but there's also horizontal fracture uh, of the same root. You can see that in the axial view on the left side, uh, there is uh, you know, separation of the uh, segments of the root. Uh, and in the middle image, uh, in the uh, in the coronal view, you can see there is a about the mid root level. There is a horizontal root fracture, and there is a generalized widening of the PDL space. Uh, and then, if you move on to the sagittal view, you can clearly see the vertical fracture where uh, the two fractured segments essentially have you know frayed, uh, and uh, there is percussion involvement as well. Uh, and there is significant amount of periodontal bone loss, um, and uh, most likely that. Inflammation in the sinus, uh, uh, inflammation of the sinus mucosa is also a result of this uh, this chronic, uh, you know, periodontal uh, infection associated uh, with this tooth and the adjacent tooth. Okay, so periodontia. Uh, so the next structure, uh, I'll, I'll show you a few examples of and uh, what the evidence uh, is uh, in the current literature for use of CBCT. Uh, let's look at periodontia. So this. Paper was it came out in 2017 in Journal of Periodontology and it was published by the American Academy of Periodontology. Best evidence consensus consensus statement on selected oral applications for for CBCT. So they list these conditions where uh, CBCT application uh, would would be helpful when an advanced percussion lesion, lesion has been detected and dental implants are being considered as an alternative treatment option. So when advanced bone loss has encroached on anatomic structure, I have a really good example here for you, such as sinus cavities or the inferior nerve. When there is questionable root fracture, root resorption, or peri perioendovision, in the retreatment of cases that don't respond favorably to localized periodontal therapy. Now, this is very important. Uh, I've seen you know, uh, more cases than I wish I would have seen where a patient had widen PDL space or it looked like the patient had, you know, periapical disease. Um, scaling root planning was done, the patients were prescribed uh, antibiotics, but uh, they never healed. And it turned out that uh, that these patients actually had, had cancer. Uh, and the cancer metastasized from distant sites to when uh, the, there is metastasis of cancer from distant sites to the jaws, 
um, generally the first area they manifest is in the PDL space because that PDL space is a soft tissue. It provides very little resistance to the implantation and spread of the metastatic cancer cells. Uh, to enhance the diagnosis and management of peri-implantitis when determined necessary. So in some cases, um, uh, when peri-implantitis is suspected, uh, the, uh, the CBCT is taken generally post-implant placement. The image that is recommended is periapical because the same analogy that when you have uh, any restorative material, including you know root filling or, or implant or any other kind of restorative material in there, they cause artifacts and then that decreases the effectiveness of the scan. But in some cases, and I'll show you one uh, where uh, you know a CBCT can still provide, even in the presence of artifacts, it can still provide you know some diagnostic value. So uh, this is a, a 27 year old female, uh, and this patient was uh, referred to me by a. a a periodontist, and he classified this patient as having atypical periodontitis. So, as you can see, that especially uh, in the maxilla, there is uh, you know moderate to severe periodontal bone loss, and the patient is just 27 year old. And uh, so, uh, the, the the periodontist you know wanted to see um, the the condition uh, of the uh, of the periodontal bone and how it relates to uh, the furcation areas of the teeth and and, and 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 adjacent anatomical structures such as the sinus floor. Um, uh, to make uh, you know uh, the, the the decisions about the treatment, so this is uh, this is a good example here. Um, and another example here is a 58 year old female with severe periodontal bone loss. Um, and so the focus I'm going to focus here uh, in the left posterior maxilla, where uh, uh, between if you if you look between the first and second maxillary molars, uh, uh, there is a very you know deep. Uh, uh, vertical sort of periodontal bone defect, and also you know there is a generalized you know moderate to severe periodontal bone loss, especially in the maxilla. The next slide is the same patient. Uh, uh, the uh, axial coronal sagittal views, as you can see, that the vertical bone defect um, has gone all the way to the sinus floor and has perforated the sinus floor and uh, causing actually uh, you know uh, if you look in the uh, in the right image. Uh, there is uh, there is a fluid level uh, or air fluid level, uh, which uh, means that there is uh, there is uh, acute sinus disease, uh, which is most likely associated with this uh, with this periodontal bone defect, which has which was very aggressive and has uh, you know uh, resolved all the bone between these two molars and also has resolved uh, the sinus floor. Impacted teeth, uh, impacted teeth, any impacted tooth uh, these days. Um, uh, generally, uh, you know, it is uh, it, it is recommended that uh, that a cornmeal CT scan is taken uh, before uh, proceeding uh, uh, proceeding with the uh, uh, with, with determining if to extract or how to extract the tooth. So, um, from a, a an orthodontic uh, uh, perspective, uh, this um, uh, these are some of the recommendations uh, regarding use of CBCT. Uh, it's a position statement by the American Academy of Oral Maxillofacial Radiology, published in 2013. So, dental structural anomalies, uh, and if there is any issue with the form of the tooth, anomalies in dental position. Um, so, if a tooth is erupting in a different place, compromised dental alveolar boundaries. So, looking at you know how much uh, you know buccal bone is there, or labial bone is there, or lingual bone is there. Uh, facial asymmetry, uh, that skeletal asymmetry, uh, sagittal and vertical uh, skeletal discrepancy, transverse skeletal discrepancy, TMD uh, signs of uh, TMJ disease uh, or temporomandibular disorders, and malformation and uh, and uh, of the craniofacial uh, uh, structures, localization for mini implants and expansion procedure assessment. Uh, and uh, this information is from uh, from. Uh, 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 is there a consensus for CBC to use in endodontics, which was published by the uh, Dental Press Journal of Orthodontics in 2014. So uh, this example here, so this patient was seen in our orthodontics uh, clinic, uh, a joint uh, a patient seen by orthodontics, oral surgery, and myself uh, in radiology, a 12 year old female, uh, and during the normal course of uh, you know, pediatric and orthodontic um, uh, treatment, uh, this uh, occlusal uh, radiograph uh, shows a radio opacity lingual to you know the the canine, uh, the premolar, and the molars. Uh, 
Um, and if you look at the radio opacity, uh, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't look like a tooth. It could be a tooth, but it doesn't look like a tooth. It looks like a more of a rectangular structure. So teeth are not really rectangular. Um, so it was, and, and this patient was to have orthodontic treatment. Uh, so it was decided uh, in order to first determine what it actually is. Is it, 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 is it a tooth? Is it something else? And you know how to proceed uh, managing this structure in relation to when the teeth around that or adjacent to it will be moved. So a CBCD scan was taken. Now uh, this scan, um, uh, in addition to you know, uh, I'll talk about uh, the uh, the uh, that radio opacity that you saw in the occlusal image. This is not a good quality scan. Um, as you can see that, you know, there is, uh, the structures are not clear. Uh, the image is, uh, is kind of blurry and there are these, you know, uh, these really, you know, white dots, a lot of these white dots there. Uh, mind it, there's no restoration in here. So this scan um, uh, is, uh, some of that has come from, uh, during the scan, the patient moved. Pediatric patient, you know, sometimes they're hard to follow instructions, even though 12 year old, but, you know, kids are kids. Uh, so the patient moved, and uh, some of that has come from there, and, and some of that uh, is, is is a result of um, of uh, the machine not being properly calibrated. So cone beam CT machines, they are unlike any other imaging uh, machines that are normally found in dental practices, for example, intraoral or panoramic. These machines require, they're very sophisticated machines, very technologically advanced, and they require proper maintenance. And, and proper maintenance requires proper um, and doing calibration of the machine as the manufacturer recommends. So this was a problem uh, with the scan that the machine was not properly calibrated and the patient moved. So these are the two things which caused this, you know, sort of uh, inferior image quality of the scan. As coming back to the uh, uh, the, the radio opacity. So now in this scan, it kind of looks like a tooth. Uh, which is present lingual to, so it's, it's a supernumerary tooth, which is present lingual to uh, the canine. The crown is present lingual to the canine. So uh, let me see if I have another image here. Uh, no, let me go back. Um, I don't think you can see my cursor, but uh, the image on the left side, uh, the axial uh, view, uh, let me just exit the, um, the full screen view. I'll come back to it uh, because uh, otherwise you won't be able to see. So here, uh, so this is the, uh, the the larger impacted tooth, and then there's a second uh, tooth here as well, which we could not really possibly see uh, in any of the um, uh, of the of the conventional uh, imaging uh, modalities. So uh, it was a uh, so the surgeon uh, you know uh, was successfully our surgeon was successfully able to extract uh, these teeth. Uh, there were actually two of them, and they were in very close contact uh, with the canine, especially, and also the first premolar. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, uh, these teeth could not have been moved uh, orthodontically um, uh, if these teeth were not, these, both of these super teeth were not extracted. Okay, go back to the full screen mode. Okay, moving on. Uh, another example of uh, an, a, a midline supernumerary tooth uh, in an 80 year old male. So here, uh, the su uh, first of all, there's a supernumerary tooth. Uh, and the patient would uh, is needing orthodontic uh, treatment. And what this tooth is doing is that it is sort of wedging itself between the two central incisors and causing a midline diastole. So that's one thing. It, it needs to be it needs to be removed. It was determined. Uh, and then the other thing is that the tooth is right smack in the middle of the incisive canal. And we know that incisive canal um, contains uh, neurovascular bundles, and it's important to uh, to uh, uh, to make sure that the integrity is maintained uh, when this tooth is extracted uh, uh, or the supernumerary tooth is extracted. So this is very helpful for the surgeon um, to have all this information um, before going in and extracting the supernumerary tooth. This example here, uh, so this is a 24 year old female, uh, tooth number 15 is impacted. As you can see that it's fairly horizontally impacted completely inside the bone. Uh, and um, we can see that uh, you know the, the primary tooth is still there. Uh, the uh, it has to be brought back into the arch uh, and into the occlusion, so it has to be determined where the actual tooth is. Um, so a CBCT scan was taken, and it clearly shows that the um, the uh, the uh, crown is located 
lingual uh, to uh, to the uh, first premolar, uh, and um, and it is uh, one of the cusp is is perforating uh, the adjacent uh, lingual cortical plate. Uh, in addition to this information, if you uh, can appreciate, uh, let me go go back here. Uh, that the bone looks really abnormal. So the tobaccovation is really sparse, um, and uh, there is increased vertical height of the of the maxilla. And it's uh, mind it's a 24 year old 24 year old uh, person. We go back to the panoramic. If you see here, the the vertical height of the mandible is is fairly tall uh, for a 24 year old female. And same goes for the maxilla. And if you look at the tobaccovation, the trabecula is very thin and sparse. So that sort of alerted me to that there is something systemic going on. So we asked the patient, and the patient, in fact, had um, had had a blood disease, a blood dyscrasia, uh, which, uh, when manifests in the jaws, uh, and looks exactly like that. It causes increased vertical dimension of the more, more specifically of the maxilla of the mandible, but here also of the uh, uh, also of the maxilla, and uh, you know we can clearly see. That uh, the uh, because of the uh, large amount of bone marrow, uh, the the tobacco has become really sparse. All right. Another example um, of a 24-year-old female impacted left maxillary canine. Um, so this patient had this uh, had this gold chain for a while. And and, and and the orthodontist were trying to pull it into uh, position, but this tooth was not budging. And so uh, it was decided to take a cone beam CT uh, scan of the area to see what was going on. Um, so uh, first of all, we wanted to see if the tooth was was uh, was ankylosed. Uh, and uh, a, a, a high resolution CBCT scan like this uh, would really give us a lot of information about about that. So uh, we can clearly see that the the uh, the PDL space uh, we can clearly see that here and here we can also see the lamina dura. So that confirmed that the tooth is not ankylosed. Uh, so if it is not moving uh, because of the orthodontic forces, it, it's not because of because it's ankylosed because it's not. Uh, it is something else. Uh, so then you know they, uh, the the orthodontist would would think about something else how to move this. So, but the information that one that uh, was needed from this is to see if the tooth is ankylosed or not. And back to third molars. Um, a, this is a very, uh, very common indication. Uh, it has been fairly established that in back to third molars, uh, if there is, uh, if there is a, 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 with panoramic imaging, which is the mainstay imaging for assessing impacted third molars, if there is any relationship uh, between uh, the uh, the impacted third molar and uh, the infalvular canal. You know, uh, CVCT is becoming a must. In this case, uh, this is a very uh, you know uh, uh, intimate relationship between that horizontally impacted uh, third molar and the infialvular canal. If you look at the cross-sectional images on the right side at the top, so here is the infialvular canal, uh, right infialvular canal, and now it is passing exactly between the roots of the teeth, which is right here, and and, and here it is passing through. Uh, uh, between the roots of the teeth and then uh, going lingually, uh, uh, and actually, you know, it is making a groove uh, through the uh, through the you know mesial root of the tooth. So not only is it passing through the forcation area, but it's actually making a groove uh, through that. So uh, you know, uh, this information is really vital uh, if uh, the surgeon wants to pre to prevent the injury to the uh, to the nerve. And you know, cone beam CT is an invaluable tool. Uh, yeah, with uh, with most of the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, third molar, uh, which especially uh, the uh, the mandibular one, but also the maxillary uh, as well. Implants. So uh, implants is uh, it's widely known, um, and th th there's a lot of information in the literature about uh, implant uh, uh, use of CBCT for implant treatment planning. In my opinion, uh, and in my practice. Uh, what I'm seeing is that you know it, it, it is essentially becoming a gold standard uh, for imaging uh, for implants. Uh, so uh, the American Academy of Periodontology, again, uh, best evidence consensus statement published in 2017 for use of cone beam CT, 
um, evaluation of root morphology and associated pathogens for extractions and reconstruction, uh, location of relevant anatomic structures and the relation to implant site, um, uh, sinus grafting, uh, pre-implant evaluation. So if there's a graft that needs to go into the implant, uh, convium CT is invaluable, and navigation of implant placement. So bone augmentation is done to see how uh, the bone graft is taking hold, uh, complications with previous implants and uh, you know, team communication with implant restorative colleagues. Uh, expert opinion supports the potential applications of CBCT and the surgical management of patients requiring dental implants in the following scenarios. When there is a question regarding selection of implant sites, the number of implants which are going to go in, uh, the diameter, length, or loading strategy of the implants, and when the patient presents with a thin phenotype or there are aesthetic concerns, risk for bone or soft tissue deformities, for example, you know, uh, if the bone, if there's adequate bone there, so sometime in the mandible, you know, the uh, uh, the vertical height of bone seems uh, okay, but if we uh, look at the, uh, the 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 buccolingual dimensions, they are, you know, uh, the mandible is very thin. So I won't I won't show you a lot of examples with the implants because with implants it's fairly, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, uh, the the precedence has been pretty much set. Um, so in this case, uh, this patient is. Um, is, uh, is, is to have an implant in right posterior mandible uh, and uh, in the second molar area. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, the image on the right side here, uh, we can uh, see uh, the implant site uh, in, in the third dimension. Uh, and we can determine uh, the length of the available bone or the height of the available bone and the width of the available bone. So these numbers can help us determine uh, the uh, the uh, diameter, the length of the implant, and also how to position and place the implant. Now, this is an example where the implant is already in, and it, it is now, uh, the patient is symptomatic. Uh, there's severe bone loss uh, in implant number 28, um, uh, or 28, well, this is the universal system. Uh, the, uh, let's just uh, say it is uh, the, uh, the, the first uh, right mandibular uh, premolar area. And uh, now these lines, these uh, radiolucent lines uh, on both these, uh, on the lingual side um, and also on the buccal side of the implant. So in many cases, they can be confused as artifacts because the artifacts around the margin of the implant or bone implant interface, they exactly look like that. But in this case, we can clearly see that there is significant amount of bone loss here and there is significant amount of bone loss here, which can also be seen uh, here as well. So uh, in this case, these radiolucent lines, they do not represent the artifacts. Um, and they actually represent uh, the, uh, the, the failure of the, of the osteointegration or the failure of the implant and bone uh, to form a bond here. Uh, and uh, what information we are gathering here is the, uh, the extent of loss. So we can see uh, uh, the, uh, the bone loss on the mesial and distal surface in a periapical radiograph, for example. But uh, if we need that information um, from, the, uh, from the lingual and the buccal aspect, you know, this uh, is, is a good imaging modality and show us that. Okay, moving on to the uh, temporal mandibular joints. Um, uh, this is a nine-year-old female with, and, and she was seen uh, in uh, our uh, clinic, uh, orthodontic clinic, uh, for orthodontic uh, uh, for orthodontic treatment, she wanted to have uh, her teeth straightened out. Uh, so, if you look at this panoramic, uh, if you compare the right condyle with the left condyle, uh, so the right condyle here is, is is fairly short as compared to the left, which is which looks normal uh, for this age. Um, and uh, not only this is short, but it seems like there is some you know increased bone sclerosis. There's flattening here, and there there's, there's, there appears to be a radiolucency here as well. So it was decided to investigate this further in a nine-year-old. If you're seeing uh, this, you know, resorption of the condyle, that's uh, definitely not normal and and uh, requires further um, further investigation. So a CBCT scan was taken. So this is the um, uh, the the right side, the right condyle. As we can see that, you know, there is flattening of the condyle. There is osteophyte formation here. There is subcortical cystic degeneration or LE cyst, and uh, the fossa. Is, uh, is it has been remodeled, and uh, there is an increase in joint space here in the anterior and, and superior 
uh, uh, parts of the joint. And uh, on the left side, uh, things are better, uh, but still there is flattening of the posterior sphere surface of the condyle, and there is reduction uh, sort of in joint space, uh, perhaps, and there is flattening of the articular eminence. Uh, so uh, this patient, um, uh, it, was, it was determined that we need to see how uh, the how the uh, uh, the soft tissues look like. So these are the MR. Uh, this is the MRI scan uh, of the TMJ. So this is the left and this is the right. And uh, here you can see the head of the condyle right here. And uh, this is uh, this chunk of you know uh, tissue is called panis. Essentially, uh, the retro distal tissues have been pulled for pulled ahead, and the disc has been displaced anteriorly. You can see the disc here. So there is anterior disc displacement here. Uh, and there is also anterior disc displacement here as well. So both the joints have uh, active uh, uh, active uh, uh, degenerative disease, um, and uh, which is more severe in the right joint. Jaw pathoses, um, any kind of abnormality, any kind of uh, pathological process in the jaw is an indication um, for uh, for could be an indication for for condyum CD. So this 28 year old female. Uh, she had persistent pain post post RCD and mandibular incisors. So the patient uh, had had pain in the in the incisors, and I and I've showed you this uh, uh, case before. Uh, I think one of the first cases where they were broken down, you know, apices floating around in the periapical area. So this is the same patient. Uh, but uh, uh, talking about uh, thoroughly evaluating the whole scan, not just the region of interest, which is the mandibular incisors, but with the whole scan. So when this scan was being interpreted, so the right mandible, which you're seeing here, um, is, is, is widened. I know it seems like it is expanded uh, compared to the left side, and uh, the bone uh, has, uh, has changed. So the patient was pregnant, uh, and, um, and these are typical signs of fibrous dysplasia. And fibrous dysplasia is a developmental abnormality. Uh, it stops, it, it's benign, it stops when the patient uh, stops growing, but um, uh, there are certain uh, situations, for example, pregnancy due to hormonal imbalances. Uh, a pregnant patient who have had fibrous dysplasia before, the lesion can start, you know, again. Um, uh, it can start, you know, expanding, it starts growing again, which is uh, perhaps the case here that um, that it is developing some of these sort of radiolucent areas in between. So it was, it was decided that we're going to monitor this patient um, for not only for uh, the uh, the mandibular incisors, but also for the fibrous dysplasia, which was an incidental finding. Um, and this is a radio opacity uh, in of the right maxilla in a 34 year old female. I think most of you probably would recognize this. Uh, this is an odontoma uh, and a a complex odontoma at that. Um, you can also call it a compound odontoma because you can kind of still uh, see these you know denticles uh, in there like a bag of teeth. Um, and it is causing expansion of the, you know, the buccal labial cortical plate and also the lingual cortical plate, um, and and uh, uh, present also probably causing some uh, resorption uh, of the of the uh, of the premolar there. Uh, another uh, patient that was seen in our endodontics clinic, a 54-year-old female, pain in left maxilla, um, and if you compare the right side with the left side. Uh, clinically, uh, you know the the uh, uh, the, um, uh, the the the, uh, the left posterior maxilla uh, was fairly you know large, but it was the, the overlying mucosa was normal, so there was nothing there, um, and uh, but uh, it was fairly uh, large, as you can see that here. You know this is the normal and this is the uh, the the abnormal side. Um, patient was able to function normally. Patient had a lot of missing teeth. Um, and so it was decided to investigate it further. So we did this uh, chromium CD scan, and we were really surprised to see you know, how much bone difference was there, which was not really manifested clinically as much. Uh, so this is how normal bone looks like, and this is the the enlarged bone. So essentially, there is fairly uh, fa uh, large, uh, fair amount of enlargement of the posterior maxilla, including the maxillary tuberosity. So as you can see, the maxillary tuberosity is expanding posteriorly as well, and and the appearance of the bone is what we call, you know, as probably you can recall, the ground glass appearance. Uh, so that clearly, you know, brings uh, something uh, like fibrous dysplasia into mind. Again, I uh, showed you an example before. This is another 
um, a kind of a different manifestation of fibrous dysplasia. Um, and uh, the issue here is to differentiate between fibrous dysplasia and an ossifying fibroma. Fibrous dysplasia, even though it is causing, you know, bone enlargement, you know, it is growing in all directions, uh, unless there are there are functional problems, you know, it can be left as is. But if it is a fibrous, uh, if it is an ossifying fibroma, then it has to be removed because ossifying fibroma is a tumor, a benign tumor, but it has to be removed. So it was determined that this patient, um, uh, the, the imaging characteristics are pathognomonic of fibrous dysplasia and not of ossifying fibroma. Uh, it, was, it, it was hard uh, because, you know, uh, ossifying fibroma, had, they're usually said to have this uh, thin radiolucent periphery versus fibrous dysplasia, but that cannot be seen in other parts. Uh, so it was determined. So of course, we are still going to be following up on this patient, but uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was diagnosed as fibrous uh, dysplasia. 11-year-old uh, female seen in the orthodontic, treat, uh, orthodontic clinic for, uh, for, for, uh, for orthodontic treatment, uh, radiopaque lesion in right anterior maxilla. So uh, this is the radiolucent lesion we are referring to. Uh, it was being decided what to do with this tool, this impacted canine. So of course, they wanted to you know, bring it into the arch uh, and, 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 you know, and align the dentition. But uh, then it was decided you know, there seems to be something uh, along the distal side of that route. So it was decided to uh, take a cone beam CT scan. A scan was taken and uh, voila, we see here is a large radio opacity uh, going all the way to the alveolar crest to the, you know, uh, all the way to the canine fossa here up, <coughs> excuse me, up to um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the sinus, uh, the area between the sinus and the nasal cavity. And in presence of this, you know, the tooth cannot really be moved. Uh, and this also has uh, pathognomonic characteristics of fibrous dysplasia with formation of these simple bone cyst like you know, radiolucencies uh, within uh, or, or along the margin of the lesion. Uh, and a biopsy was taken and it showed that the patient, in fact, has fibrous dysplasia. Uh, chronic maxillary sinus disease. Uh, so, as uh, you can see, that when we scan the maxillofacial region from uh, the base of skull all the way to the inferior border of the mandible, Invariably, we image the nasal cavity and the maxillary sinuses. And maxillary sinuses, maxillary sinus disease is fairly common. Um, and uh, the right, the left side is normal. But if we look on the right side, um, if you can see that uh, the there is complete opacification. The sinus is filled with, you know, thickened mucosa and uh, and whatnot. And there is some uh, some uh, uh, air accumulation in the sinus here as well. If you compare the posterior sinus wall here, this is normal. And this is thickened, which is has become thickened. Uh, the bone has become sclerosed in response to chronic you know, infection in the sinus. The medial wall is also thickened. The anterior wall is also thickened. Um, so uh, this is a chronic maxillary sinus, uh, sinusitis, and this patient need to be referred to uh, to uh, to an ENT specialist. Now, uh, if you look at this uh, image here uh, and this image, you know they look kind of the same. But if you look closely, uh, this specific patient, about 45-year-old female, uh, a male, 45-year-old male, and this patient, uh, this uh, case was referred to me by a sleep apnea specialist. So the uh, the uh, the doctor, the dentist has um, has uh, uh, limited their practice to uh, treating sleep apnea, and uh, so he took the scan to look at the airway, patient's airway. Uh, but then um, uh, he, you know, task specific evaluation was the evaluation of the airway. And then, you know, I got the scan for, you know, the full evaluation. And, 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 and of course, you know, if you look here, um, uh, there is uh, this radio, uh, there's this uh, high density mass, um, uh, soft tissue density mass in the left maxillary sinus. It has uh, eroded the uh, medial sinus wall it is into the nasal cavity. It has eroded uh, the, uh, the uh, palate, uh, the buccal cortical plate. Uh, it has eroded, it is going into the you know, pterygo maxillary fissure. It has eroded the sinus floor. Um, and uh, this was determined to be a, 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 a uh, it was signed out as a malignancy, most likely a, uh, a squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, on biopsy, the patient uh, turned out to have, be having uh, a, a, a uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So the patient walked into the practice to have a treatment of sleep apnea um, and, 
and uh, walk out as uh, walked out as having a, a cancer. Uh, this example, the 41 year old male. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chaudhry, uh, we just have maybe five more minutes, uh, so I'm wondering uh, how many yes, more uh, time uh, you need. Yeah. Uh, five more minutes. I'll finish that in five minutes. Uh, so a 41 year old male, uh, chronic osteomyelitis with sequestrum formation. Uh, so the patient had an extraction. Uh, the, the, the lesion was not healing uh, and it was decided to take a, a, a cone beam CT. And as you can see that, you know, there is a sequestrum formation, you know, dead piece of bone floating around in the socket. Uh, there is uh, erosion uh, or, or, um, um, or resorption of the lingual cortical plate, the buccal cortical plate. And this is pathognomonic. There's some periosteal newborn formation here. All of these findings are pathognomonic of chronic osteomyelitis with sequestrum formation. Upper airway, so this is the last segment, uh, upper airway uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, upper airway starts from uh, the tip of the nose and goes all the way to, uh, the, uh, to the larynx, uh, the upper part of the larynx here. So all of this is called the upper airway. And uh, with sleep apnea uh, being uh, a fairly common uh, anomaly and dentists now having a, a, a role to play in managing sleep apnea along with uh, the medical colleagues, uh, CBCT really has become, is becoming uh, a mainstay imaging modality to evaluate the upper airway from tip of nose all the way uh, to the laryngopharynx. So uh, conclusions from this study, uh, reliability of upper pharyngeal airway assessment using dental CVCT, a systematic review was published in 2017. Uh, so CVCT has a moderate to excellent reliability with airway volume having higher reliability than minimum cross-sectional area. So CVCT helps us in determining the total volume of the airway and also helps us in determining uh, where the, the airway is narrowest and also help us in determining if there are any physical issues with the airway, which are causing obstruction of the, uh, especially of the, uh, of, of the pharynx. Some example here. So this patient uh, is sitting here in an upright position uh, at the level of the soft palate. There is a severe obstruction of the airway. Also not that, but the scan has also showed us there is an abnormality of the C2 vertebra, uh, which we can see here that may be, you know, um, uh, may be uh, um, uh, causing uh, or, or adding to uh, the airway narrowing. Uh, not just that, there is calcification of the anterior longitudinal ligament and causing a protuberance and narrowing the airway. Uh, in this 60-year-old uh, male, again, the patient is in an upright position, and this is the level of the soft palate, and we can see that how narrow the airway is. Uh, and imagine when this patient lies down, uh, the soft palate falls back and pretty much blocks the airway uh, and this patient uh, bought, uh, was uh, was having severe, you know, sleep apnea problems. Uh, Forty-two year old female again severe airway narrowing at soft palate level, uh, and one of the uh, structures which are obstructing is the enlarged palatine tonsil. So as you can see, that they are protruding and and and, and causing airway narrowing. Um, uh, the I think this is my last slide. Uh, uh, another example of a forty-two year same patient. Uh, a different level, as you can see that uh, that uh, the tonsils was narrowing the airway at the soft palate uh, oropharynx level, and as we move down to the level of the posterior one third of tongue, these are the lingual tonsils uh, which are which are enlarged. They are opacifying the laryngeal vellicula and also narrowing the airway at this level as well. Um, yeah, this is my last slide. A 64 year old female airway narrowing at the tongue level, and in this specific patient. You know, the, there is polypoid thickening uh, of the uh, in the area of the lingual tonsils, so which occupy the posterior one third of tongue, and these are causing airway narrowing here, as you can see that. So, especially in older patients, uh, when we see these kind of you know uh, uh, polypoid thickenings or thickening uh, in the lingual tonsil, it is always advisable to you know either to look at the tonsils themselves, you know, have use a tongue depressor and look at them clinically, or send them to their physician or ENT specialist uh, because this area had, can also develop certain type of cancers and they can manifest uh, uh, similarly. So it is, it is always wise if you see this to, uh, to at least examine uh, clinically how they're, how they're looking like. So that brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm here. Uh, I'll uh, hand over to Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaudhry, for such excellent uh, presentation. 
and uh, we have uh, some time for a uh, few questions. So um, I don't know if you can see the questions by any chance. Uh, um, yes, so um, I can see some questions here. Um, so first is, can you highlight medical legal implication in UAE for not reporting other extra oral findings on CBCT by a dentist when a full FOV is taken for implant placement? So, um, you know, medical legal implications are fairly standard um, anywhere in the world, um, and not just the UAE, and not just the United States. Uh, as healthcare providers, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, it is our prerogative, you know, we, we are able to prescribe CVCT scans for any and many different kinds of indications, including implants. And, uh, but that also binds us in providing uh, the interpretation of the full volume. If you miss something, uh, which later uh, becomes uh, a, a determined as a significant, you know, finding which was missed. Um, uh, you know, my uh, I don't have any literature from UAE uh, to show you, but uh, it is a general understanding that uh, that it can be uh, it can be a medical legal challenge uh, for the clinician. So I will because I'm not a lawyer. Uh, and uh, there is just a very limited data as far as UAE is concerned. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, these th these things can become medical legal challenges for uh, for the uh, prescribing clinician. Uh, excellent. Uh, just uh, before we go to the next uh, question, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we are posting now uh, the link for the evaluation form, and in order to get uh, in order to get the credit hours, please uh, fill the evaluation form and please uh, give us uh, like a 24 hour to 72 hours to get the certificates. And also you can see the link on the screen and also with the QR code. Yes, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, I think you can continue answering the question. Next question is, um, uh, is the Coinbeam CD available globally? Um, well, the answer is is yes. Uh, uh, there are so many manufacturers uh, of Corn Beam CT now that it is available for purchase in pretty much all the countries of the world. Uh, now, is it available, um, um, uh, for example, let's say uh, in UAE, I think it is available uh, very easily. Uh, there are so many practices that have Corn Beam CT. At Dubai Dental Hospital, we have two Corn Beam CT scanners. And we also, you know, uh, people refer who don't have their own CT scanners, Conduit CT scanners. You know, we get referrals from uh, from from other practices. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, uh, pretty much uh, wherever Conduit CT is available, um, it is fairly common to refer your patients to other dentists or or, or an imaging center that have a Conduit CT to have have your patient scan. <clears throat> Uh, another question is uh, when purchasing a CVCT from the wide variety available, considering wanting to see intricate details pertaining to general dentistry, what brand or type would you recommend? Um, you know, uh, I would not want to recommend a specific brand, uh, but uh, I can give you a general guideline that let's say you are a general dentist. Uh, your use for cone beam CT is to you know, look at you know root canal anatomy for endodontic purposes or if you want to place implants or if you want to assess in, in implant sites uh, uh, then a small field of view cone beam CT scanner would be good enough for you. you you don't need a large or medium field of view because uh, you will not be for example versus an orthodontic office where you know they have to scan the full head or an oral surgeon uh, or oral maxillofacial surgeon where they have applications where they need to scan the whole head. So uh, depending on what kind of patients you plan to see, you can determine if you want the small FOV, medium FOV, or large FOV. Another important point, uh, brands are generally, uh, the technology is, has, has become so commonplace that, uh, that pretty much all the brands are very comparable, but make sure that, uh, that whoever uh, is your vendor uh, they have a very reliable and robust presence in your region. So if there is a need for after sales service, they're there for you. That, that, that's very important in my opinion. 
All right, so uh, can CVCT be a valuable tool to assess the degree of resorption of the dialysis? Absolutely, yes. Uh, so root resorption, if you want to assess root resorption, you know, there is no alternative to Cone Beam CT at this point. Cone Beam CT is the, uh, is the you know, imaging modality of choice uh, for assessing uh, that. Um, another question, can we exchange between the use of CVCT and normal panoramic, panoramic radiograph in order to reduce the amount of radiation? Uh, so uh, my understanding is that you're probably asking that, you know, uh, you took a CBCD scan for an indication, and then uh, if you want to follow up, can you take a panoramic? In certain situations, it may be okay. But in certain situations, for example, um, uh, that uh, you are, uh, let's say you have placed a, a bone graft. Uh, and then if you want to follow up on the, you know, uh, the progression or the integration of the bone graft, then uh, then it, it's best to you know follow it up with the CBCT versus a panoramic image. All right. So can we use micro CT for clinical purposes yet? Uh, no, micro CT is essentially used for uh, small animal or, or or even you know medium sized animal imaging. So or you know um, uh, imaging of uh, you know samples. Uh, not for human imaging. So micro CT um, is provides higher resolution than cone beam CT. Uh, the technology and the concept is fairly the same as CBCT, but it is optimized for more more lab uh, uses rather than clinical uses. Our specialist dentists allowed to use and interpret CBCT, or they should take certain courses. Uh, either you are a general dentist or a specialist. Uh, both of uh, these categories of dentists, they can own Convium CT and they can, you know, prescribe CT, Convium CT scans and, and use them for, for, for clinical practice. Uh, there is no differentiation there. Um, but uh, the whoever you are, general or specialist dentist, always take as many courses as possible uh, uh, to, to familiarize yourself and to make yourself uh, really well versed in how to interpret or how to navigate CBCT scans. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Chaudhry, for uh, for the excellent uh, presentation and for answering all the uh, questions. So I just want to remind uh, everyone that if you want to get uh, the credit hours, just uh, try to uh, fill the evaluation form. And, uh, and I did post the link in the question and answer tab. Uh, so that is a link for all the um, for uh, for the evaluation form. Uh, also, I want to share with you a link for uh, for our uh, uh, YouTube page in which you can see all the previous uh, presentation on, uh, on on YouTube. And uh, in case if you have any kind of a question or related to the presentation, uh, I think you can even uh, contact Dr. Chaudhry. Uh, directly for any kind of a question and uh, if you have any question about uh, about our uh, courses uh, you can uh, you can contact us at uh, dental.cbd at mbru.ac.ae and I did post uh, the email address there. So uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Chaudhry again for uh, such excellent uh, presentation and I want to thank everyone for attending. And uh, we hopefully uh, will meet soon uh, with um, another uh, presentation. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you. I will just keep the session live for a few uh, more uh, minutes in case if you want to access the uh, links.
Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.